I'm first up to talk about an article that we published in 2017 with, uh, well, folks on our research group, as well as a, an outsider from Tyler, Texas, Ron Dawson, who did all the fiber work. The story on this case really, uh, I mean, it highlights a lot of things that relate to um, Libby Amphibole, uh, the pattern of disease, the appearance on CT, the appearance uh, at operation, uh, the actual analysis of the tissues all the way through from histology, histopathology, all the way through to fiber burden analysis. So we, we were able to incorporate about everything we possibly could in this case because it's so demonstrative of what we see in general. So we, we take the, one of the, uh, uh, the 74 year old gentleman who we'd followed in the clinic for a number of years. And, had a, uh, we had uh, diagnosed as, as having asbestos-related pleural disease for a number of years. Dr. Whitehouse, I think, was first to diagnose him. Uh, and uh, anyway, um, he qualified for our lung cancer screening program. He worked uh, through his work career. He was actually a 21-year worker at the vermiculite mine uh, beginning in 1969. And then uh, he, um, uh, he went up to mine closure in 1990. And uh, he'd always been short of breath with his activities, but uh, experienced a chronic, severe uh, thoracic pain. And uh, he kept going to the emergency room and had several cardiac workups, all negative. And, uh, and uh, came back to us, and he had very straightforward pain related to his pleural disease. So we were, treat we were following him for that and also had to medicate him. The pain was so severe, he, couldn't, he, he had no other choices. And we, don't, you know, we have no other specific treatments in the way of anti-inflammatory or otherwise that work. Uh, this is what he looked like uh, uh, in 2014, but what I want to point out here, if you look closely, there's a little thin layer of soft tissue density between the rib and the lung. And uh, 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 you have to almost go through a whole scan to be able to really appreciate the consistency of that thin layer that goes down through the chest cavity. But uh, he would not be read as having asbestos-related disease in general. He would not be identified as such. We were just accustomed to the appearance of this thin layer, so uh, it it's easier for us to make that association as this being a structural change from exposure to living amphibole. But anyway, uh, in, in, in this lung cancer screening program he was participating in, uh, which is also carried by our, our, um, uh, our screening grant, which is uh, the lung cancer screening is part of that. Uh, he, uh, we identified an early uh, lower left lung cancer, uh, biopsied in, uh, by needle and proven, and then he ended up uh, going through a, a vast lobectomy. In other words, with a scope, uh, his left lower lobe was removed. And during that time, the, uh, uh, the patient had agreed to give up some of that tissue for us to further examine. And, uh, and so the surgeon was able to take a picture. And, uh, and so uh, this is what things look like. This is the uh, area, this is the lung right here. And this is where the lobe was removed. There's staples in here and that sort of thing. But you'll see a line of demarcation right down this way. And then on this side, you'll see this sheet of white along the chest wall. This is the chest wall. And uh, this is the parietal pleura, but obviously it's not a normal parietal pleura. It's been thickened with fibrous tissue. So anyway, the PATH report from the hospital uh, once again confirmed they had no carcinoma of the, of the, left, the lower left lobe of the lung. And then there was presence of pleural fibrosis with chronic, chronic patchy uh, inflammation. So we had this opportunity to, to send this down to folks that do asbestos work all the time. And, and so with that, we uh, utilized uh, folks from uh, Tyler, Texas. Uh, and they were interested because this is, they knew this would be the first report of, of a vermiculite worker who has gone through extensive evaluation and fiber burden analysis. So once again, it became a, uh, something we could afford because they were willing to do it because they knew they would have a paper to write. And uh, so uh, we, we definitely got uh, a, a great opportunity here. So anyway, so when they got the tissue, it was, it was very obvious that uh, there were just a, a large number of ferruginous bodies, which are the, the, you know, the coated the, uh, uh, fibers that uh, create a certain appearance uh, under microscope 
and uh, uh, he had, I forget, 150,000 or so of these uh, in a gram of, uh, of uh, lung tissue. Uh, but uh, there was presence, once again, of the pleural fibrosis with the inflammation. But also, they saw a grade one parenchymal fibrosis. So, so he had, uh, also had asbestosis. Here's a, here you can see, this is one of the ferruginous bodies. This is a, an asbestos fiber that's been coated with a protein and iron uh, complex. And it's usually club-shaped on each end. And then uh, you can see they're like barbells. Uh, but this, he had uh, numerous of these in his tissue. Uh, and uh, these were dissolved away and analyzed. And we'll go through that an analysis uh, here in just a little bit. So uh, here, after doing the digestion and then uh, doing the uh, fiber counting, uh, this gentleman had 5.4 million amphibole fibers per, per gram of wet lung, which is just uh, pretty incredible. You know, it's, uh, it, as a matter of fact, Ron Dawson called me and said, why doesn't this guy have asbestosis? I said, they don't show this. They show pleural disease. You know, you don't see the, what's going on in the, in the inside of the lung. You see these, this layer that forms on the outside. And eventually, of course, we do see interstitial fibrosis late in the course, but it doesn't progress that way. It doesn't progress as an interstitial disease. So he, I, he didn't understand that because he said, if we saw that with Christ Tower, that many fibers, they would have had a, a, a advanced interstitial lung disease. And uh, so anyway, the average fiber length, 13 microns, with the longest 63. 18% were under 5 microns. In other words, they're really not regulated fibers, but they're, uh, I think, it's hard to argue that they don't have some potency. It's just not as, they're not as potent as the fibers that are over 5 microns and, and longer. But most importantly, no regulated fibers were identified in the tissue. So he didn't have any asbestos in his lungs. He had Libby amphibole in there, which is a non-regulated fibrous mineral. Things that you learn from this, uh, besides just, uh, you can see uh, uh, this very high exposure with uh, the typical thin, diffuse pattern to it. Well, go ahead. Brad, so, sorry to bug you. Did they find any of that in the plural space, though? No, no. In the plural tissues? Yeah, no. Plural, as right, as right. Plural. It was all parenchymal. Uh, he didn't analyze the pleura as well, or the, the, the fibrosis of the pleura. Was he he did. He, I don't think they've seen enough of them to even spend the time. You know. That would be really interesting, too. Yeah. Like yeah, I don't, yeah, I know. But I don't think uh, they find that many, so they just yeah, they, they don't do it very often. So. Yeah. But, the, uh, but anyway, imaging, seldom identified by radiologists on CT. This is so common. Uh, it's just, not, if you're not familiar with what it looks like, you ain't going to see it, you know, and that's what works with the, that part. And, uh, but the other thing that struck me was, is in general, pathologists don't have a background in looking for asbestos-related changes. It's like, are you kidding? So, we, you know, how, you know, ferruginous bodies, we all, I always thought, well, that'd be easy to, I mean, I could do that, you know, medical school, we, we do that stuff, you know. But anyway, I thought that was interesting, and then you, so you really are, you know, we're really compromised in our ability to have the right pathology to get the people to look at our tissues. We lucked out on this one because we had an interesting situation that had a, a, you know, a publication with it, and it, therefore we got the services on the fiber analysis for nothing. So it, it was very valuable, but we, you know, I guess it points out that, you know, we'd really, monies for tissue analysis would be very valuable so that we could look at more of these tissues and really learn more from them, so. I would think most pathologists that would have called them all asbestos bodies, knowing that there was asbestos there, because you wouldn't have the sophistication to be able to identify whether it was a ferruginous body yeah. versus a classic a regulated asbestos body. Yeah, yeah. And they yeah. would just say asbestos. Well, yeah. <laughs> but in this case, but, you'd but, be able to do that. But, but, uh, but if you have an interstitial lung disease mm -hmm. and your pathologist isn't looking for ferruginous bodies, then it, it's a huge clue as to causation uh, when you don't have a good exposure history. In Libya, we obviously have a great chance to understand exposure. We know pathways and that sort of thing. So anyway, public health implications. So anyway, disease causation in this minor was associated with non-regulated living amphibole fibers. Well, it's, very, it's of interest. Uh, the current EPA strategy allows for ongoing use of, of asbestos-containing materials. Hard to believe in this, this day and age to think that 
our EPA says, oh, no, it's okay to use certain things with asbestos in them. It's just, it's, un, it's really unpalatable for us, us in public health to even look at that. And uh, even, uh, they're not even looking at living affable in the scope of risk for asbestos that they're doing currently that will be completed at the end of this year. And they're doing that with all other asbestos in place. How it's not the real risk, because most people don't even know that they're getting around it when they're there. And they don't want to even categorize where it sits and how to protect people from wandering into places where they're going to get exposed. We have pictures of workers all the time going to these places with wrapped laggings, falling off pipes, and, and that sort of thing. And I go to meetings. I've, we were down in uh, L.A. at a meeting here just last week. Had, uh, anyway, our, the guy with the booth next to me says, hey, what's this stuff you guys got? Uh, we have some of that in the wall of our house. We're remodeling. And he said, I didn't know what to do with it. And his wife looked it up on the Internet, and she said, no, we got to pay attention to this stuff. <laughs> They, they, had no, they had no idea what, what, it might, what hazard there might be with them breaking it out of the walls and working around there and kicking it up and throwing, you know. And, uh, it's, and then, uh, is it Pat Morrison, uh, Firefighters Union? Remember? Yeah. He, he caught me after one of the sessions. He said, our firefighters, they run into this all the time. They're, they'll go back to put out a, a fire that's still smoldering and say in the ceiling, and they'll knock that out, and it all just pour, pours all over them, vermiculite. And this is all over the country. And it, you can't tell me, how is not, that uh, not a, a, in the scope of risk that the, the EPA would consider uh, as in the future uh, to try to uh, protect public health and, and occupational health? It's just, yeah. Anyway, it uh, needed to say the, uh, we're contradicting all knowledge and science about asbestos and living amphibole and uh, 40,000 deaths a year from asbestos uh, diseases, which is just the tip of the iceberg, probably. I think we all know that death certificates are probably, they pick up about a third of what's really happening, but obviously high and not going to get better if our approaches are going to stay the same in terms of continuing to use and import asbestos materials. So. So anyway, real quick, I wanted to do this one. I just put this together because I thought, oh, I can't have Roger come over here and not, not at least make him do some extra work and that sort of thing. No way. Yeah, I thought it was interesting because it does feed right into what I think he'll be talking about. But anyway, we have a 46-year-old female who grew up in Libby. Uh, she uh, she uh, went, uh, uh, had a history of uh, intermittent pleuritic pain on each side of her chest for a number of years. And we saw her in 2015. She had a normal screening evaluation at that time. And uh, her history was that both her parents uh, have asbestos-related disease, and, and she's lost several uncles with asbestosis. Uh, so uh, it, it, uh, uh, she had uh, numerous pathways of exposure, at least 10 in the community during her years growing up in, in Libby. And, uh, and this was her, I just show a, a section of the lower chest just to show you, hey, this is a normal looking kind of scan. You don't see any kind of thickening around uh, the lining, uh, the lung. The, the lung uh, should lay against the rib because the lining is too thin to be seen normally, uh, unless, of course, it gets thickened for some reason, and then it becomes visible. Anyway, in 2017, she presented with left pleurisy and, and a pleural effusion. And uh, had fairly severe pain uh, that continued on for about eight months. Uh, we had to follow her with serial uh, x-rays to just to make sure we weren't dealing with a, a mesothelioma. The pain was that severe and, and unrelenting. Uh, she also had developed a significant obstructive uh, component to her uh, lung disease. Uh, and uh, we... Uh, had, uh, uh, this was at that 2017 screening again, uh, again where you see the, on the left, in the left lower lung, there's uh, some fluid and then some uh, uh, signs of uh, uh, banding uh, and uh, likely uh, an inflammatory process. So anyway, uh, her pain uh, uh, continued. Uh, she uh, kept getting more short of breath. She had continued to have a lot of uh, obstructive airway disease, uh, 
she had also had a history of joint pains for a while, but never really had problems. But then in uh, 2018, her hands began to swell, and she showed them to me, and I said, well, boy, this looks too familiar. So we, uh, we did her um, uh, serology, and she it was, in fact, uh, rheumatoid factor positive, and uh, she subsequently has been uh, followed by a rheumatologist uh, in Kalispell. And this is what she looks like in 2018. Now you can see how she's, her disease went from the left side where she's developing uh, diffuse uh, pleural changes and now on the right side, a similar process. Needless to say, she's typically, of some of these patients, they, they, they continue to have this severe pain. They don't sleep at night. Uh, she doesn't tolerate pain medication well. We, we got her on multiple pain medicines, and she cannot tolerate a, a, any narcotic pain medication. So we've tried to get by with what we can there. She is on Embrel for her rheumatoid, and uh, she continues to be, have a debilitating cough. She can't, she can't get a job because the employers won't let her in because she's too much of a scare away for, the, for their, their customers. She's, she coughs that much. She can't, there's, we've been unable to help her control that. So, so anyway, that's, uh, that's the plight of, a, of, of, of patients in our population. And, uh, what was her exposure threat? Oh, well, she grew up, and they're not far from the railroad track, but they, they're, uh, she grew up, played in the piles. She did, there were like 10 different pathways. She was, yeah. All right, well, listen, I think, Roger, you can comment on that and start on yours if you want to.